You're listening to The John Hammer Show, thoughts and discussions from a preacher, disciple of Jesus, author, poet, and pastor. Brought to you by the Sunrise Podcast Network. For more information about Sunrise and or the Sunrise Podcast Network, check out isunrise.org. This podcast is also sponsored in part by Seattle Bible College. For more information about the school, check out seattlebiblecollege.edu. Welcome back to my podcast. Well, if you've been on before, uh, (laughs) or welcome for the first time, and I'm joined here by a couple of our staff and friends, uh, Jason Gibbons, our worship pastor, and Tara Johnson, my assistant, and her and her husband do the youth ministry uh, here at, at Sunrise. And so excited to be back today talking about a controversial issue swirling around the interwebs. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, the NAR, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation in Christian Nationalism. And there was actually a statement that was released by a bunch of Christian leaders, uh, by someone that I work closely with, Bishop Joseph Matera, mm-hmm. and Dr. Michael Brown, along with some other leaders, uh, Bible scholars, uh, came together and believed that we needed to create a statement of clarification about a movement that we've been associated with to affirm the positive aspects of that association and to reject erroneous or negative or unhealthy right. parts of that affiliation. So uh, anyway, I don't know, like, depends on what group you follow, who you follow, what heresy hunters you follow on YouTube or <laughs> what bloggers you might read. Uh, if All you, of the above. Um, about what the NAR is. Um, and so I just wanted to start off a little bit with uh, explanation of my history with the New Apostolic Reformation. Um and I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to let it all hang out. Because uh, <laughs> that's what we do. Unashamed. Right. Uh, is the person who coined the term was a very close personal friend of my my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Wagner was a missiologist who was on the mission field in uh, South America for many years. And then uh, ended up becoming a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary and teaching on missions. And really... Uh, He's a missiologist, so he's given his life to study the mission of the church mm-hmm. and trends in mission, um, pract- best practices for mission, for church growth, for how to take the gospel to the nations, how to advance the gospel in your own nation, how to grow your church, how to grow the church by multiplying churches. You know, all, all this is uh, his what he's given had given his life work to, and he's he's now with the Lord. Well, I believe it would have been in the nineties. Uh, he coined a term by observing current trends in global church patterns mm-hmm. and church growth patterns called the New Apostolic Reformation. And so one thing that missiologists do is they label, they they kind of create labels, or uh, if they notice a trend, yeah. they, they they name it. You know, they do they do something like categorize that. They things. categorize things mm-hmm. and they try to to label them, define them so they can write a book or they can release their findings and people yep. can kind of grab onto it and try to understand. So Peter Wagner started, or he he didn't start, he coined the term New Apostolic Reformation. And what he meant was, and I he was at some conferences at our church and I got personal time with him. Um, my dad and I were on a trip to Colorado once and we got to, I got to go to his home. My dad has been in his home multiple times and, yeah. and was a part of one of his leadership teams. So um, I don't know, some people are just quitting the podcast right now and they're never going to listen to anything I say, but that's, unfor- <laughs> no. that's unfortunate. Sad. Yeah, that is unfortunate. That's sure. unfortunate. Is that uh, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> from Dude Perfect or something? Yeah. Wheel unfortunate. Uh, Wheel unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Um, well, so I had got to talk to Peter Wagner personally about it too and and hear him talk about it and what he described the New Apostolic Reformation as was this idea that Globally, the church was gathering more around apostolic leaders and following certain leaders uh, than they were even their tradition, traditional movement or denomination that they were a part of. Mm-hmm. So he just meant that these dynamic leaders were rising up globally that had large influence, that developed networks. Mm-hmm. And out of those, that leadership and out of those networks, it was causing the church to grow very rapidly Mm -hmm. um, all over the world. And an example would be like, and I, 
I in my talk with him, he he felt like it was also true, not just in churches that believed in apostolic gifts or spiritual gifts continuing after the apostles, but that really across denominations, they may not call themselves an apostle or an apostolic leader, but you could look at like when Rick Warren wrote okay. um, his book, Purpose Driven Church, mm-hmm. uh, pretty soon churches all over America, Pentecostal churches, Baptist churches, independent churches, Congregationalist churches, Lutheran churches, they're all doing 40 days of purpose and they're reading Purpose Driven Church and, yep. and churches are rewriting their mission statements to reflect the five yes. purposes of the church that Rick Warren laid out. Right. And what he was trying to say is Rick Warren was a type of an apostolic leader mm-hmm. who had a huge influence over... Thousands of churches. I mean, right. millions and millions of people in these churches were being influenced by his ideas, and then eventually he wrote the Purpose Driven Life as well, yeah. Yeah. and that had even more. That right. was like more, you know, I was, direct. I was one of those. Yeah, as like I read pastor. one of those. Yeah, yeah right. For yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I. Uh, so he was just trying to say, like, look at all these people following an apostolic leaders' mm-hmm. advice, influence, ideas mm-hmm. about how to grow your church and de- develop a healthier church. Um, doesn't matter what their denomination was. It wasn't because their bishop said to do it or, or right. you know, their regional overseer. It was, they, they were just, they liked what he was sharing and they followed right. him, you right. know? Yep. And so you see that kind of phenomenon happening all over the world. So anyhow, the New Apostolic Reformation then shortly thereafter um, started to, now Peter Wagner did start an organization called I, well, it used to be called, um, ICA, International Coalition of Apostles, and they changed it to International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. Mm-hmm. And then there's another branch called the U.S. Cal, U.S. Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. And they switched the name from ap- apostles to apostolic leaders because they wanted to not, they didn't want to give people cover for abusing power, saying, I'm an apostle, you got to listen to me. Right. Mm-hmm. They said, well, we believe in the function of apostolic ministry, not, but we don't want to empower unhealthy models of that. Right. By mm-hmm. people just grabbing onto titles and power and stuff. But so so anyway, so Peter Wagner started that organization, but there was there was never an organization started called the NAR. And there's actually a bunch of different apostolic networks that have different names and different leaders. Mm-hmm. And some of those leaders associate at varying degrees or levels with each other. Yeah. But what happened was is that people heard this term, New Apostolic Reformation, and it in my opinion, it ended up getting more defined by the critics of the continuation of apostolic ministry than the people that were actually practitioners. Because Mm -hmm. the practitioners didn't really collaborate on a, you know, come together on a definition, and not not even all the apostolic leaders were, you know, under the leadership, if you will, of Peter Wagner. Um, Mm -hmm. Some were affiliated and were a part of his leadership teams, but many weren't. Um, many were friendly probably, but you know, Mm -hmm. uh, so you started having people say, oh, the NAR, it's like, and they, they start painting this picture that there's like this Christian Illuminati and it's like, (laughs) you know, Bethel church in Reading and Hillsong and Brian Uh, Houston and Mike Bickle in Kansas city. And then like all these, and then these people that are involved with government and Christian nationalism, like they're all working together in these secret Pentecostal meetings to overthrow governments. And they believe the kingdom of God's going to come on the earth and they're going to take over every government on the planet and Donald Trump's going to help them get there at faster. And so we all got to vote for Trump and we all got to get our churches on board. And then we're going to Christianize this nation and drive out all the, the evil pagans and and start a Christian utopia across the planet, you know? Right. And then you're like, well, I don't know, some of those people might be friends, but like, you know, like... Mike Bickle doesn't see end times the same way that Bill Johnson does. Right. And, uh, and Hillsong isn't directly affiliated with either group. Uh, they might have been on a platform at a conference together. Some of them a couple times have been friendly. Right. But, like, there's no group. And I've actually been a, a member of the U.S. Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. Mm-hmm. And there's no backroom meetings <laughs> about how to... There's no secret handshakes. ...take over the world, secret handshakes. I mean, we unapologetically want to win people over to faith in Christ yeah. because right. we want to love and serve people and share the gospel with them. And we want the governments of earth to have godly values that promote flourishing and life mm-hmm. and reduce poverty and help people be successful and live out their purpose, yes. you know, um, absolutely. But this whole thing has sprung up. So part of why I want to talk about this today with you guys and for our audience is... I want to try to give some clarity because, sadly, because of the misrepresentations, there's people that are calling people that embrace the apostolic heretics, and people are leaving yeah. churches, mm-hmm. they're breaking fellowship, and we actually agree on all the essential doctrines of right. the Christian faith, whether you embrace the apostolic ministry or not. That's 
not like central to our faith. And things that have been associated with NAR, like Seven Mountain Mandate, um, some people call it Seven Mountain Doctrine, which is something I never even heard from people that taught Seven Mountains, was that it was an actual doctrine. It was just a mission strategy to reach mm-hmm. people in different areas of society. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and then Christian nationalism, like some of these things have all got boiled together, and people are leaving churches, breaking associations, labeling people false teachers, and it's, I think, globally harming the cause of Christ because of misunderstandings. And um, so I signed this statement along with other Christian leaders, like people I respect, like Randy Clark and Heidi Baker. And boy, there um, there's a big list of all the people. Uh, like I already said, Dr. Michael Brown and Bishop Joseph Matera, Pastor Ben Dixon, Ken Fish, Alan Hirsch, mm-hmm. Dr. Craig Keener, you know, some people that are a part of different movements. Um, some of them I've got to meet and uh, and know a little bit, uh, but a lot of great um, people that uh, have signed this document because they wanted to bring a plumb line of truth. And historically, when the church had different theological issues, they would come together with leaders and try to write some body of work that they yeah. agreed on to say, like, this is, this is what we affirm. And so... Um, I know there's people that maybe for some reason didn't, don't want to sign it because they think it maybe is too extreme on one explanation or the other, or they just feel like they don't need to get, they don't need to get involved in it. Um, but I just wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the new apostolic reformation, why it matters, um, and, uh, about this statement. So Wonderful. thanks for joining us, yeah. everybody. Now that you have a little so intro. I have a question just off yeah. the bat. Like... Just thinking about Christian nationalism and NAR, how do you think those became connected, like in in the critics' minds? Um, well, I think the primary way that NAR and Christian nationalism got combined in a lot of people's mind was that a lot of people see NAR as a uh, a movement of trying to gain consolidate power with mm-hmm. Christian leaders mm-hmm. that have all this authority and power because mm-hmm. they're apostles yeah. and this big grandiose title. And so they're trying to consolidate power mm-hmm. and then influence governments with said power and take over nations from the top down right. to like make them Christian by force even. Right. Um, so th- I think that's the idea behind it is that... Um, they make some misjudgments on what most people think of as um, apostles uh, and the apostolic function of the New Testament church, right. the prophetic function of the New Testament church, yeah. and how that's lived out by these groups. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a book called um, The Rise of Network Christianity, how independent leaders are changing the religious landscape. And that book is by... Um, Oh, that's oh, that's different. I thought it was by Holly and Doug. I might be giving you the wrong the wrong book. So I'm gonna have to find the name of that book. But there was a a book by an author, Doug and Holly, and it was I thought that was the same title. So that's interesting. Mm. Um, we'll link it in the comment section or okay. in the description. Yeah. So anyhow, but they really believe that they were warning about this whole idea of the NAR and um, other authors have interacted with them. Uh, Randy Clark does a really good interview with Remnant Radio on the NAR. Mm. And then uh, Bishop Joseph Matera, who is one of the you know masterminds behind this statement um, that we'll look at here in a moment, um, also just finished one of his doctoral, uh, in his program, it's called An Artifact, but basically a doctoral dissertation called the global apostolic movement and the progress of the gospel. And that just came out on Amazon within the last month or two. Um, So that gives a lot of definition and he interacts with some of Doug and Holly's criticisms. um, And so does Randy. And so one of the interesting things is a lot of people believe that the NAR, you know, these apostles are grabbing all this power and everything, but Randy Clark interviewed the head of like dozens of apostolic networks like the top leaders of these organizations. Yeah. And he found out that 90% of the apostolic leaders that run these networks, um, let's say there's another church that's a, and a pastor that's a part of their network, 
the apostolic leader does not have any financial say over that leader or their church or ministry or have the authority to fire or hire people for that organization. Right. So he said, if there's all this charge about these apostolic leaders that are consolidating all this power and they can't direct the money and they can't direct who works or doesn't work in an organization, how are they abusing power? Right. Right. You know, I mean, right. they might have a lot of influence over people because people might look up to them and mm -hmm. bounce ideas off them and look for advice from them. But um, it's, I think, really yeah. characterized by, unfortunately, a big misunderstanding. And the thing I love about this statement, um, and you can get it actually at N-A-R, N-A-R, and ChristianNationalism.com. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing right now because it's a little lengthy. Yeah to read, but you can see that uh, this statement affirms the Ephesians 4 function mm -hmm. of the fivefold ministry yeah. of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Some people like to say shepherd and teacher, apest, apostle, yeah, yeah A-P-E-S-T, apostle, mm -hmm. prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, uh, that we affirm that these are still gifts that are functioning today in the body of Christ for building up the church. Um, but we reject that, and it's early in the statement, that apostles have the same authority as the 12 apostles of the Lamb in the right. New Testament. Right. That there's an apostolic function, just like there's pastoral and evangelistic functions and teaching mm -hmm. functions that are yeah. still active in the church. How is the design of Christ's church and how the leadership of Christ's church should be should yep. function and, yep. and flow uh, in, in churches through every age and generation? Um, however, they do not carry the same weight as New Testament apostles. And just like we don't believe that New Testament or prophets today, I should say, have the same authority as the Old Testament prophets who were prophesying scripture. Right. And, right. you know, there was like a prophet appointed to the nation and then yes. they everything they said happened on a national level, <laughs> you know, right. and like we and we honor the prophetic and think that there are prophets that God uses today but not with the same authority as those that right. wrote the actual scriptures. We get to judge and weigh prophecy today. Back then, I mean, you can make judgments on prophecy to a certain degree, but like as a prophet of God, it was like when you rejected the word that they sent, you rejected the Lord himself. Yeah. And now it's like you have the ability to discern everybody as the Spirit in the New Covenant. And mm -hmm. now in the right. church, we all have the Holy Spirit. Right. So we can judge and weigh what prophets say based right. on what the Spirit is confirming to us through our understanding of scripture. Mm -hmm. And, and as he leads us. So uh, this is a, uh, this has been a controversial topic um, because people have assumed the worst about apostolic ministry. Right. And I think it's important that yeah. apostles or those that embrace apostolic function, I don't think this statement was written to appease critics, but it was really tried, written to bring clarity. Yeah. Yes. And help help people know like this is what we actually believe. So I really love for people to get to that website n a r and christiannationalism dot com so you yeah. could read uh, the statement um, we'll put for the yourself. Link in the description too. Yes, we'll put the link. <laughs> we'll put the link in the. Thank description. you. That'd be so good. I can I ask a question? Yes. Because one of the things that has kind of always troubled me about this whole idea is. We're saying that there's an apostolic function, right? That there mm -hmm. that there's people that function apostolically. They have this like fathering type yeah. way that they influence or the mothering church. or if mothering. If women yeah, are, could be apostles. I mean, I believe they can. But yeah, so father mothering, you different. know, yeah. this this broader kind of parenting. You mm -hmm. have this heart, right, for people. How is that so widely different from the original 12 apostles? And why do we have to make such an incredible distinction? Because it seems almost petty in some ways that we have to like delineate oh. this so strongly. Well, I mean, what, why we should delineate, that's a good question. Why we should say that there's a difference is because um, the apostles, some of them at least, wrote the New Testament. So we're not, so some people, um, and it's even in this statement, some apostles would believe that like whatever they teach about spiritual warfare, influencing nations or like so-called new revelations mm -hmm. because their apostle is like mm -hmm. they're writing scripture okay. today. Yeah. So that's what we're saying. Apostles today or apostolic leaders are not writing scripture. We're not adding to the canon. And we believe that the 
Bible is sufficient. Right. You okay. know, yeah. um, others believe, others are in certain movements are coming into cities and saying to a pastor of a local church, well, like what apostle are you submitted to? And they're like, uh, they're from a tr- tradition or a denomination that doesn't identify apostles. Mm-hmm. And they're going, well, you're a false church. You're a false pastor. You need to be submitted to the apostles because I'm like a continuation of the 12. And I have rank over you. You, So you need to start giving me money and you need to start running your decisions by me. And so we're in this statement, we're saying we reject that a local church has to have an apostle to be a biblical church. You know, like, I mean, I believe that it would be more biblical for people to embrace the apostolic because that's what I see in the New Testament pattern and what uh, Christ gifts given in Ephesians 4. But... If I'm with a Lutheran brother or Methodist brother, and they're like, well, we don't really call it people apostles and da-da-da-da-da, I'm not going to go, oh, you're a false church and you need to submit and the apostle has rank. And then like even in the book of Revelation, we see like the 12, you know, the, we mm-hmm. well, the 24 elders and 24 you, elders. you see like, and the apostles of the Lamb like that are represented in heaven. So there, there did seem to be something special about the authority that the first, the ones that kickstarted it all wrote scripture. I mean, Paul wasn't one of the 12 and he wrote part of the New Testament. Right. So, so that... it's it's not a totally clean, I mean, right. it would take a lot more time to unpack <laughs> some of the nuances of that. But, and there are dozens, I think there's like, I forget the exact number now, but there's dozens of apostles mentioned, not just 12 yeah. um, in the New Testament. New Testament. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's, you know... Uh, quite a few. In fact, there's more apostles mentioned than pastors or teachers or prophets right. or evangelists than anybody else. It mentions apostles the most, and mm-hmm. and that's and most the majority of those aren't the twelve because there's only twelve of the original. And right. Right. you know, but even the the twelve even you know cast lots after Judas died and Jesus <coughs> left and in, in, the, in Acts one. They had to get a new. So that did seem that it was very important at the foundation for them to have twelve, mm-hmm. and. There was some kind of special, you know, yeah. Paul called them less than the least of all the apostles, you know, um, in a sense. And it was maybe, it was just great humility, but there seemed to be something that he acknowledged. Yes, I was given amazing, I was given the revelation of the gospel that all mm-hmm. people will be judged by one day. Mm-hmm. But he, even he kind of had this acknowledgement, like, I'm especially called by the grace of God, even though I'm not a, one of the original right. 12. Well, and they just raised up so many apostles mm-hmm. Like you were saying, throughout scripture, there's mm-hmm. definitely an emphasis on it. Mm-hmm. And it seems like, I kind of on both spectrums there, that like we make such a big deal out of this whole apostolic movement as it being mm-hmm. um, corrupt. But then also there's clearly scriptural evidence for it being important. So sometimes it's hard to delineate really yeah. how, how much emphasis should we be putting on this in our Um, understanding of how God formed his church and how, and what our purpose in kind of even that whole idea, like we talk about, you know, Mm -hmm. the apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, how important is that for us to really spend time on and really unpack? And I think it's hard because there's that, that corruption aspect, you know, that, the power Mm -hmm. that comes in and people abuse it. And so then it really makes it difficult to really delineate, okay, yeah. this this very clearly is important for Scripture, but how do we protect mm-hmm. that? Yeah, well, I think that's partly what they want to do with the statement is to draw yeah. some biblical boundaries around it and like healthy practices of integrity and, mm-hmm. and honor and things like that. Uh, I think you bring up a good point, Tara, because the Bible warns us about false apostles, mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. false teachers. Yep. Um, even yeah. about, you know, even in the Old Testament prophets about shepherds or pastors that are doing, yeah. are corrupt. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so all forms of power can be corrupted and yes. all yeah. forms of leadership can be corrupted, but they can also be good and healthy. So yeah. I think sometimes, unfortunately, we do throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Yes. And it's like, oh, well, there's all these wacky apostle teachings. So we're just going to like, yeah. we're just not going to believe them anymore. Yeah. But there's pastors that have done horrible things and and most yeah. churches haven't kiboshed the idea of having a pastor right just and if, because there's bad examples and mm-hmm. if you think about it i mean the first the 12 mm-hmm. who abused it yeah. judas yeah right. you know i mean so right there your first right. 12 there yeah. was already one that was abusing right. his power yeah and, and peter was, wasn't always so great either <laughs> wasn't so but great he was either. still but he was you know obviously good in the end he just yeah. he yeah. was working through peter immaturity and, and stuff <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> yeah. peter right but <laughs> judah yeah but Judas, and, I, and I, even the Lord had selected one that 
rebelled, yeah. And yeah. I think even what you're saying too, um, when you have statements that clarify mm-hmm. and are based on scripture, you know, mm-hmm. the statement obviously isn't scripture, but it's based on scripture. Mm-hmm. It really, it helps people to see like, hey, that's not how the apostolic function is supposed to operate. Right. Yeah. And so it helps bring clarity like we were talking about, um, which I think is very important because you can yeah. see, obviously this is, you know, it's gotten kind of like out into the ether. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and it's, it's just stirring up and, and we've seen that so much, especially recently when things get out there and then mm-hmm. they just go all over the place. But you come back to really what was the original meaning of what uh, Mm -hmm. NAR stood for, you know. And then also knowing that uh, C. Peter Wagner set up an organization that really kept, you know, was for, uh, what was it called, the U.S. Cal? Yeah, yeah, Um, ICAL and U.S. Cal, Cal, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was a place, too, where there's accountability. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. there's a place for, you know, and so... um, and if you guys know Bishop Joseph Matera, I mean, mm-hmm. an incredible leader, you yeah. know, incredibly submitted man yeah. to the Lord and to yeah. accountability. So, yeah. um, anyway. Totally. I wonder too, sometimes, like, I think maybe I just get too much in my head about it, but a little bit of how much of this comes out of, not to transition us to Christian nationalism necessarily, yeah. but... Well, might be a good point, actually. <laughs> to, like, where some of this pops out of our individualistic thinking as mm-hmm. Americans, yeah. where... Mm-hmm you know, in Eastern culture, it's really normal to have some of these hierarchical structures that we're not used to. We don't like that. We want to be able to do our own thing. I don't want to submit to a leader. And I mean, I can, I, I struggled with this concept originally kind of, Mm -hmm. kind of go, it was weird at first. Um, because I didn't understand it. Right. And so we didn't, Mm -hmm. we didn't gain that understanding, but that Christian nationalism really becomes, I think, sometimes the overarching thing that sets us apart in the world view of things because we're so individualistic mm-hmm. and um, we forget the importance of, I would even say the importance of having generational um, covering and different things like that, that an apostolic leader could bring to young yeah. leaders to, mm-hmm. um, you know, because yeah. we, we don't, do a great job in some of our denominations of, of having that structure. I mean, you, you could look at like Catholic or Lutheran structures where they've got yeah. some of that more uh-huh. built in yeah. a little bit to just how they yeah. organize. Gotcha. Well, I mean, I would see that the, the apostolic function and movement, you know, like even in the new Testament, it's not totally clear that apostles had the rank over the churches. I mean, mm-hmm. there was some people, are, and it's beyond our scope today, were bishop and elder interchangeable or did a bishop, I mean, over time a mm-hmm. bishop was like a kind of a continuation of the apostles and they had more regional authority mm-hmm. and kind of the more that fathering mm-hmm. authority over multiple churches or over a region of churches. Um, but uh, in the New Testament, like you see glimpses where like the local church, like in Antioch and Acts 13, they pray and fast and they send out uh, Paul and Barnabas mm-hmm. um, first, you know, and so the church is appointing the apostles that are sent uh, and sending them, and it and then but then the apostles go start all these churches, and then Paul definitely argues for his authority, especially over churches that he started yeah. with them. Sometimes, like you guys aren't really respecting that, like I, I begot <laughs> you in the gospel, like right. I'm your spiritual dad, like give me the honor, you know right. that mm-hmm. that you should give me, kind of thing. Um, but then in Ephesians, I'm sorry, in Revelation 2 at the church of Ephesus, uh, Jesus commends the church at Ephesus for judging apostles and finding them false. Mm-hmm. So it appears mm-hmm. like a local church and the yeah. local elders sometimes have authority to judge an apostle, and then there's other times where the yeah. apostle's putting the church back in order. So it seemed like there's actually a reciprocal okay. relational yeah, yeah, yeah. system where like apostles did have authority... But we don't have any clear teaching that apostle had a higher rank than an evangelist, mm-hmm. or that uh, I mean, there is there is First Corinthians twelve, first apostles, then prof. You know, like there yeah. is there is somewhat of an order of leadership. It appears to some degree, but then that leadership isn't like unilateral. Like I'm in charge of everything because I have this title, mm. and I think that's one of the reasons to make a statement like this is to try to bring balance and yeah. try to think holistically about how does the apostolic 
function within church systems. It's not there to dominate or lord over people. Yeah. But that function is important yeah. of, like you're talking about, yeah. where, you know, the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Lutheran Church, mm-hmm. some of those churches that are more hierarchical, the high church, right. um, they kind of built in a system of like, you know, priest goes under bishop and bishop do a cardinal. I mean, not all those have cardinals, but anyway. But, but yeah. uh, and of course, the Catholic Church all the way up to Pope. Um, but that's the whole idea is yeah. that there's a hierarchy, there's someone that's mm-hmm. covering you, mm-hmm. there's someone that you're accountable to, there's someone there to help support you, you know. Yeah. Right. And I mean, that is a portion of what the apostolic function really should be, yes. uh, is that there did seem to be a lo- authority in each local church, but then local churches were also helped by bishops and apostolic leaders right. that spoke into them and fathered them and... Anyway, yeah. But, so I believe the the function is very important. I believe God has res, is restoring it to the church, and I think that's that is why the church is growing globally at such a rapid rate yeah. is mm-hmm. because of this apostolic is a sent one. It's a pioneering spirit. Mm-hmm. It's a fathering. It's a birthing. It's a like we want to start churches. We want to raise up leaders. Right. We want to make them strong and healthy, mm-hmm. and get them on mission. Apostles are mission focused, mm-hmm. and that's that mission of Christ that He gave the church to go into all the nations and make disciples. So they they really run after that, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Right. wholeheartedly. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know why I was just uh, mm-hmm. when you guys were talking. I was thinking about I looked it up here. First Corinthians one. You know, where Paul's talking about the divisions in the church. Uh-huh. And he, he goes, you know, famously he's saying, what, what does it mean that each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, mm-hmm. I follow um, Peter, I follow Christ. Yeah. It, which I think is interesting. He has, I follow Christ. You think, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> you know um, but but then he goes on to say, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? You know, it, it's just it's just interesting that even in this time as the church is being developed and it's spreading, yeah. you know, there's starting to be divisions and people are like, well, I follow this person, right. I follow yeah. that person. Yep. And then, well, I don't follow anyone because I follow Jesus. Yes. I'm not like you guys. And right. even that one, he lists. He like, lists it. You yeah. can do that in a false pride, which is yeah. pretty crazy because obviously we're all supposed to follow Christ right. <laughs> at right. the end of the day. That's what it's about. No, absolutely. I, you're so mm-hmm. right. And and even you see Paul's like, you know, he goes on just talking. It's like, I am very grateful I didn't baptize any of you. you know, except, <laughs> then he goes on, well, I did baptize this, you know, them. And so, uh, well, but Christ did not you. send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of eloquent wisdom, unless mm-hmm. the cross. Anyway, but uh, it, it is interesting. Even I think you see in this, you see sometimes this whole controversy is the division sometimes of the church thinking I have, you know, the right mm-hmm. way to approach it. Mm-hmm. What it ends. And, and there's always, I think no matter where you go, you can look in Baptist, you can look assembly of God, you can look Pentecostal overall, charismatic, wherever you go reformed. Yeah. And there's going to be controversy and, yep. mm-hmm. and, and things that we're going to run into and issues and, right. you know, and people are going to abuse their authority. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, I, that's why I love, here's the scripture bringing us back into focus yep. of what mm-hmm. matters, right. yeah. you know, and it's not these divisions and not all the people we're following, mm-hmm. but as we're following in uh, right. Christ and people, especially people that um, have that apostolic calling on their life, you know, the importance of them walking scripturally right. and following uh, is very important, so. I think mm-hmm. it's funny because I was about ready to jump on the, you know, apostolic train, but now I'm back to the Jesus train. I'm just going to follow Jesus to who needs Jesus apostle. Train. Just kidding. <laughs> yes. yeah. Right. But that's the, t- that's the tension, right? Of keeping Jesus at the center and making sure that you're lining your, your life and your choices and your actions up against the rubric of, stri- of scripture. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think that's the scary part of even nationalism, right? Because then you start to put your own um, patriotism above scripture. Yeah, yeah. And you start to elevate, you know, being being an American or being, you know, whatever yes, country right. above being a Christian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I do want to say too, like to understand a biblical uh, view of the apostolic, I would recommend Joseph Montero's The Global Apostolic Movement mm-hmm. and the Progress of the Gospel. Mm-hmm. And that other book that's critical of the apostolic movement, it looks like there's a couple of them actually, is by Doug, I'm going to mispronounce it, maybe Givet yep. and Holly Pivik, mm-hmm. and it's a New Apostolic Reformation, question mark, a biblical response to a worldwide movement, and also there's God's super apostles uh, encountering the worldwide prophets and apostles movement. So 
um, those are just some resources for people that are interested. But I yeah. think uh, what we want to encourage people to do is look at the Bible mm -hmm. yes. and derive their theology from the New Testament more than their tradition, mm -hmm. more than what they've heard. Yeah, It's easy to listen to critics and go, oh, wow. I mean, you... You want to dump down an internet rabbit hole, just get on any heresy hunter. They'll tell you everybody that believes everything wrong and why they're wrong. And But it's important to go to original sources and not just the critics. It's important to go to mm -hmm. practitioners and theologians and people that act and find out what do they actually believe yeah. Yeah. and not just go after things that misrepresent, misrepresent what people do. But right. I believe that if the Ephesians 4 gifts were given to the church, then it's of the utmost importance that we embrace those gifts because this is the Ephesians 4 Paul says this is the measure of Christ's gift given to us is mm -hmm. through these five uh ministry yeah. functions and uh if we were to deny two of those functions or three of those functions um and we're just only embrace pastors or only embrace pastors and teachers maybe if we're really excited we embrace the evangelist too <laughs> Um, you know, that we're yeah. limiting the yeah. fruitfulness and the power. So I wouldn't say it doesn't matter. I mean, but I'm going to fellowship and honor other parts of the body of Christ, whether they agree exactly the same. If they agree that the Bible is God's word, that Christ is, you know, the son of God, fully God, fully man. Mm -hmm. He came to die for us. We can agree on the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. We can right. agree on these major truths of Christianity. Then we should be able to fellowship with one another. Yeah. And then these are secondary differences. This is not a matter of whether someone's a Christian or not, what they believe about apostles, what they believe about miracles, what they believe about you know, different leadership functions in the body of Christ. This isn't a reason for me. I might not work as closely with somebody if we have a big difference on how to structure a church, yeah. but I can honor them and I believe I'm going to spend the rest of my life with them in heaven mm -hmm. because we believe in the Lord Jesus and what he did for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Right. Um, and that's, that's the main thing. And so there is this, also this addition to the statement on Christian nationalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, what comes to your minds when you hear Christian nationalism? Nazis. Nazis. <laughs> I don't know why. It's so funny. Like in definitely I don't know why, but you're like, for me being in America, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think of just I when I hear the word nationalism, I'm thinking about like duty to country. Okay. You know, um do you a see, pride of country. Do you see it as a positive or negative connotation? Well, I I probably see it more as a negative connotation just okay. because of culture. Okay. Um but uh I just have to sit back and think yeah. Christian nationalism. Yeah. What it means, actually. Right. What it literally means. So. I always just feel like it's an, almost an. Well, if you say Nazi, hopefully it's a negative connotation. I don't <laughs> yeah, totally. Definitely In that sense, a yes. negative connotation. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I mean, I think I have pride in my nation as far as like mm -hmm. I'm proud to be an American and all that. But um, I'm thankful that I get to live in this nation, right? Mm -hmm. But. When I hear Christian nationalism, I think of people who just have taken it too far. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just, I, yeah. I, it's hard for me to reconcile those two and really yeah. have it be um, a positive statement. I just think we've seen, especially over the last two years, the polarization of the mm -hmm. nation. Um, and especially it feels like in the church where, you know, you're either, you're either right or left and there's no coming to the middle and there's, you know, yeah keeping um, the Bible at the center, right? It's, you know, keeping the, we got to uphold the constitution above everything else. And I yeah. just, you hear things like that, mm -hmm. that really, I mean, well, actually grieve your heart. Yeah. Well, I really love this part of the statement. I think it's very clarifying, but it could also produce more questions for certain people. That's what I wanted to ask you guys about what you think about Christian nationalism. And yeah. there's kind of a movement, um, you know, on the, it's interesting how these things happen, but like, uh, you know, woke used to mean somebody that understood what maybe black people or people that were minorities were going through and right. could identify with their pain or their story. Mm -hmm. And they're like, man, that guy's, they're woke, they're hip. Like they understand yeah. kind of like they're, they, they, they seek to understand people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but then it got turned into people that were more supporting Black Lives Matter and then like mm -hmm. social Marxism. And now conservatives use it as a pejorative term. Yes. About yep. anybody that's like believes in like queer theory, gender theory, like radical practices. So it's like, yeah. oh, that person's woke, and then they just write them off. Yeah. Yep. But on the on the left side of society, or even left side of the church, now Christian nationalism is used as a pejorative term. Yep. So it's like all those 
MAGA Trump supporters. They're just a bunch of white Christian nationalists trying yep. to shove their religion down everybody's yep. throat. Right. And they're a horrible representation of Christ. And they, you just, so when somebody says, oh, that person's woke, pe- certain people will tune yeah. them out. And other people say, oh, that's a Christian nationalist. They'll tune yeah. them out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's become very unfortunate yes. um, that we get to these things where things get so polarized that you can't even actually sit down and dialogue yeah. and, and, you know, interact on issues. Yeah. Well, now, yeah, now if you have a picture with somebody, you're yeah. like, wow. Oh, yeah. You are pretty much that person. Yeah, you're that person. Yeah. yeah. So, guilt by association. Guilt by association, big time. for sure. So, uh, yeah, guilt by being in the same zip code yeah. as somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, well, so Christian nationalism is, uh, and I like the term that they're using on the this statement, or they're defining it a little bit, because mm-hmm. they're talking about how they're trying to differentiate between Christian nationalism and extreme Christian nationalism. Right. It's hard to be able to use the right terms to make everybody happy. Um, because on the one hand, Christian nationalism means to some people, and the Finocchio brothers, Nathan and Gabriel Finocchio, yeah. who have gained influence through their theology website, the OCU, um, and through their social media platforms, mm-hmm. they would argue kind of that Christian nationalism, according to like a C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton, some of the great thinkers on Christian orthodoxy, uh, you know, um, write some incredible defenses of why we should be nationalists and just meaning that we should organize our nation around Christian values and principles right. that cause the flourishing of all our society. And we should prioritize our own nation in the sense that you prioritize your own marriage Mm -hmm. and family like it isn't evil and selfish of you to care for your spouse more than you care for everybody else in your neighborhood or in your city or your state right um you have to prioritize and so they're saying there is a healthy term as some have understood it traditionally some of these great thinkers is like well you prioritize your your nation means prioritize your family you're not prioritizing it at the expense of others. I mean, to a certain degree you are, because mm-hmm. you're trying to take care of those closest to you first mm-hmm. before just taking care of everybody else yeah. Yeah. or whatever. Um, but then there's this idea that other people use it, and they mean more like a Christian imperialism, or right. they end up promoting globalism. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's like, depends how you define it. Like, So do you mean like you you should be after the self interest of your nation and you should go into any war and dominate and rule other people well that's more globalism or, i mean that's more imperialism mm-hmm. and then there's globalism which is like we're all in this together to such a degree that don't take care like lose you should lose your culture your values right. and just kind of right. meld into this generic yeah we're all one people society we're mm-hmm. all one people mm-hmm. and the and and the the christian nationalist this I think more healthy or less extreme that would say, well, I think we should retain the beauty of Italian culture and yeah. Ugandan culture and mm-hmm. Australian yes. culture or the native American people. Like when we came as an imperialist, we, that wasn't really Christian nationalism setting. No. That was imperialism, right? <laughs> you know, and taking over land and dominating right. people. Mm-hmm. If we would have respected people, we would respect their land, their border, their language, their values. Right. And then, our different nation states, like different families, should learn to get along, right? right? So, so the term is is very, like, very divisive because it means different things to different people. And some people say, well, we should be patriotic, but we shouldn't be nationalists. And then some of the na- Christian nationalists I've heard say, well, y- you're confusing the terms, and you're actually promoting globalism or imperialism. Then, mm-hmm. if you're not promoting American uh, nationalism or, mm-hmm. or whatever, so. Um, I think they did a really good job with this statement. And I think, again, there's positive elements of the mm-hmm. term and there's negative elements yeah. of yeah. the term. And so they did a great job nuancing uh, without compromising, I think, yeah. biblical truth, mm-hmm. um, yeah. why we should reject certain aspects of nationalism. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of Christians are in America are a little confused about these issues sometimes. Yeah. And one of those is I do think that as Christians... We love our country, support Christian ideals in society, but that we have a Christian duty that's higher than an American duty. Mm -hmm. And as great, I think, from my knowledge, the Constitution of America is the greatest political document that exists on the planet for governing a nation state today. Right. Um, And I think it's wonderful. And I think we should uphold values as an American of our Mm -hmm. Constitution. But I don't believe that it's my Christian duty (laughs) to promote and fight for the Constitution above like win people to Jesus and make disciples and follow right. the Bible. Yep. 
you know, um, I am called to be a good citizen according to the scripture. Yeah. And I do think the constitution promotes values and ethics in society that are based on biblical principles mm-hmm. that would help society. So I, I mean, uh, there's some merit to wanting to, for people to defend the constitution, I think from a biblical mm-hmm. perspective, but, um, I love the last part of this statement that I do want to read a little bit of, uh, and it says um, that we believe that it's spiritually dangerous, number one, when we wrap the gospel in the American flag or any other national or state flag. Number two, we equate our country with the kingdom of God. Number three, we confuse patriotism with spirituality. Number Mm -hmm. three, we compromise our ethics to keep our party or leader in power. Number five... Our church denomination or ministry becomes an appendage of a political party. Number six, we put more trust in early in earthly methods than in spiritual methods. Number seven, we marry the cause of Christ to the cause of a political party or leader as if they were one and the same. Number eight, we become as vulgar and rude as the candidates we follow. Number nine, we look to the White House or any branch of government in any nation more than to God. Mm -hmm. Number 10, we make a human being into a political savior. Number 11, we equate loyalty to God, which should be... unconditional with loyalty to a party or political leader which should be conditional number 12 our prayers and our prophecies become politically partisan and then he goes through this whole there's this last part is that we conclude by contrasting the kingdom of god with extreme nationalism i won't read all of these but to get the sense of it for our listeners the kingdom of god prioritizes the advancement of the gospel extreme nationalism prioritizes the advancement of its ideology even at the expense of the gospel Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God produces loyalty to Christ above all. Extreme nationalism produces loyalty to one's nation above all else. So I think there is this sense that we need to be careful that we stay Christ followers first. Mm -hmm. But this statement, if we were to go through all of it, you would say it's important for Christians to vote, for Christians to even run for political office as God leads them. It's important for us to be engaged as salt and light in our society as Mm -hmm. Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. And politics is just one of the spheres or ways that we can do that, not the way. Right. Right. So I think there's confusion about, well, isn't America, uh, you know, a covenant nation? Like America has a covenant with God. And I do, yeah, there were some, some of our founders, the pilgrims, some of the early leaders that came here that were Christian, made covenant, made a pledge with God that this would be a Christian nation, a Christian land. And I think that's wonderful that mm-hmm. we have Christian values at the foundation and we should seek to live out those values right. in every generation. However, like it gets a little murky because God made a covenant with Israel when he chose Abraham and said, I'm going to make a covenant with your family. And that's different than us making a covenant with God yep. when God makes a covenant with us. Because by that logic, if another country in the world becomes predominantly Christian and then they say, we're making a covenant with God and we go to war with America, then they could justify their wars or their annihilation of us right. saying, well, we're, we're the Christian nation now. Right. You know, so there are some extreme elements where people are calling for violence in the name of Christ. And I don't know, we don't want to get into just war theory today. I do think <laughs> that there is biblical provision for government leaders to call wars and Damn. to go to war. Um, and but um, we're not we're not fighting Christian wars or holy wars, mm-hmm. you know, in this age of the church and of the new covenant and there is there is government you know, there yeah. is government spheres so i think some of this statement was designed to remind us like hey some of the ideas we have come from more like maybe american history books and certain pop culture ideals or mm-hmm. remember walt disney even used to make a lot of content about america and faith and kind of how yep. they're mixed together and there's this very beautiful exciting a uh, romantic view mm-hmm. of like everything yep. used to be perfect at one point in our country right. and everybody loved God and everyone's like, well, there was been a lot of corruption in our nation's history and yeah. early in our history before abortion was illegal and then it was made legal again in 1973. It was mm-hmm. legal for a long time. Yep. Yeah. And there was things like the first and second great awakening in our nation, uh-huh. um, right. which made a big difference on the direction of our country. But the reason we needed a first and second great awakening because there was times where we were very ungodly. Yep. And so great. we sometimes have a romantic view of um, the perfection of our nation. I think there's so many wonderful things to value. And I think, again, it's important to love our nation, mm-hmm. pray for our leaders, mm-hmm. be engaged, to be patriotic even, I think is is wonderful. I think we see Paul's example in the Bible is like he seemed to be 
I don't want to say proud in a bad way, but he seemed to be honored to be a Roman citizen and right. to lean on that, to be like, I'm a, I'm a citizen of Rome. That's I, right. Yeah. right. You know, uh, and I, I think it's, it's okay for us to say, I love being American and also admit that there's a lot of flaws, a lot mm-hmm. of corruption, a lot of mm-hmm. evil that's been done in America. Mm-hmm. Um, but to love our country and to yeah. want our country to embrace values that are Christian, because right. even if someone isn't a Christian, I would argue that a society governed by Christian values would be a society that would cause fl- human flourishing mm-hmm. yeah, um, in that society more than any other worldview. So it's like, well, I don't believe, I don't want Christian nationalism. Do you want secular nationalism? Do you want witchcraft, Satanists, right. satanic nationalism? Do you want, you know, somebody's gonna Marxist dominate. nationalism? Yeah. yeah, Nazi nationalism? Like, yep. um, and so we do have to be careful that when people come in the name of Christ in government that we're not just letting them have their way because they say they're Christians they want to work with the church because they might just be using the church for power. And you look yep. at like Hitler and some of the things that happened That's in right. Nazi Germany, he he they helped him get to power because he was appealing to their national sentiment but i would i would argue that some some people that are critics of christian nationalism say well that's a great example of christian nationalism destroying the nation but hitler wasn't really he he was going beyond christian national he was going to imperialism and to dominate every race that wasn't aryan right and destroy the world and kill all the jews so like right. if you were a nationalist you would have just stuck to helping your own nation be better you would have been going to war right with Conquering all these other countries the and a true christian nationalist actually would only pretty much go to war for defense. They wouldn't be yeah. like running after. Mm-hmm. They would. They would be more resistant. They'd probably even be more critical of our modern wars, um, yeah. because they'd say like, "Well, did that really help our people and our nation first? Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, um, they're they're complicated things because a lot of what we're formed by, I think, is like folklore and remnants and stories and movies it's kind of like when you ask most christians about heaven and they think well it's like there's like little naked angel babies floating on clouds <laughs> right you know yeah. uh in the sky and we just right. sing little songs with harps and mm-hmm. yeah. uh or the end times is more informed by novels and yeah. stories that have come out than yeah. it is the actually biblical theology the meaning us there right? yeah right. so yeah. i think our our love for country is good but if it becomes idolatrous mm-hmm. and it becomes an extreme place where we're more concerned about political platforms and power than we are about Christ and his kingdom, mm-hmm. then we've, we've got out of balance. And isn't that like at the cr- uh, crux of mm-hmm. the issue, so many issues, is that something replaces, you know, Jesus yeah. Yeah. on the throne in a yeah. sense, like yeah. of mm-hmm. our life yeah. Yeah. and him being Lord and master and mm-hmm. savior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think even just looking at that, like, you know, there is, like you, you mentioned about Paul, like he was proud to be a Roman citizen, you mm-hmm. know, but it wasn't the very thing that drove. What did he give his, end up giving his life for? It was right. For, for the gospel. For the gospel, for the gospel. yeah. Right. It wasn't for Rome, mm-hmm. right. you know. And that doesn't mean, too, if you, you gave your life to serve your country, you know, that doesn't mean that you... Had, are raising that above God. We're for veterans. Right. Yeah, we're yeah. Yeah. for veterans. And <laughs> oh, for those who absolutely. have sacrificed. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that's... Um, and that's the trick and it's we live in a very we live in a in a broken world and god is perfect his authority yeah. is perfect his judgments are perfect yeah um and he's given us these different spheres of responsibility i mean you even look at jesus and like there is multiple times that jesus interacts with soldiers mm-hmm. and none of them are rebuking them for being a soldier even for the roman government right. who's yeah. occupying israel and oppressing right. god's people the jews yep and he doesn't hold them personally responsible right. for maybe what they're... I mean, he tells them, like, if you're a soldier and you're going to go do certain things not to, like... Or you're a tax collector, you know, working for them, they don't extort money from right. people and abuse your power. Mm-hmm. So he, he speaks a word of warning to them a little bit, mm-hmm. but he doesn't... Um, he doesn't condemn them for serving. Yes. You know, he heals their... He heals them. He right. or their their servant, right? He yeah. he does things Absolutely. to show love and care for them as individuals. And even Paul, it implies that he says, "Greet the people," you know, in in Caesar's household, implying that maybe th- some of the soldiers that guarded him came to faith in Christ, right? right. You know, and so it's kind of like where you're called, represent Christ to the best of your ability. And I think people do need to serve their nation and we honor people that are brave and that have laid down their lives, Mm -hmm. you know, for our freedoms. And it's easy to become critical of governments or military endeavors um, while, you know, cursing or criticizing them from a 
place where you get to be free and comfort comfortable right. because yeah. of their sacrifices. Right. Absolutely. You know, and so these are complex issues mm -hmm. that really have to be well thought through. Yes. Um, and, and a lot of times we need space to be able to talk about some of these things or even mm -hmm. to say, hey, we're not anti-soldier. We're no, not yeah. anti, yeah. Uh, yes. you know, because it's hard to fit it. And so I'm thankful for platforms like this that we do get to dialogue a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Statements like this that come out that hopefully help us think more biblically. Mm -hmm. Um and us to examine, like, why do I believe what I believe about these things? Right. Why am I so, are my priorities in order? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, am yeah. I representing Christ well right. um, to the world around me? And and I think part of it is like the apostolic movement, the Christian nationalist movement. There's some areas where they need to, they need to be reined in. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a part of the apostolic movement. I don't know where I'm at with the Christian nationalist movement. I want my country to follow Christian values and principles right. and I want good godly leaders in place. Yeah. Right. Um, so some people might say I'm a Christian nationalist, but then there's other times where I see people do certain things and I'm like, Oh, that's like, you guys are lying or doing something wrong to get power or you're mm -hmm. compromising your biblical truth. I don't align with that, you know, yep. right. kind yep. of nationalism. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so, um, anyway, uh, I, I think it's important that we, we look at these things, we wrestle with them, and yes. at the end of the day, we hopefully let God have his way with us, that we'd be more faithful to Christ, yep. and we'd reflect him better to the world around us. So, yeah. Amen. That's good. Yeah. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today, yes. and hopefully this is helpful for you listeners. Thank you, John. If it's That's more good. confusing, or you have more questions than you've ever had, send them in, info <laughs> at isunrise.org, and we'd love to be able to interact with them yep. in the future. But make sure but, you uh, read the statement. Yeah, read, yeah. The, statement read the, statement the statement first right. before you... So. Yeah, read the statement. All right. Thank you guys and God bless. Thanks for joining the John Hammer Show. Please give us a thumbs up, like, and subscribe if you're enjoying the content here. And the best way to support this podcast is leaving us a great review. Thanks.